And we are so excited that you've carved out some time to be with us on this wonderful, a little bit lazy weekend, right? A little bit sleepy weekend. That rain just kind of uh, softened everybody's uh, sleep uh, last night and this morning, too. In the early service, it was raining so hard you couldn't hear what I had to say, and people starting to doze off. So if that happens in this service, just know I'm going to get louder so to try to wake you up. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to read into, ver- into chapter 13. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27 is where we're going to be today. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible with you and you want to follow along or you're not following along on your mobile device, if you'll raise your hand, we have some folks who are moving around right now who will bring you a Bible to use and uh, you can follow during this time. If you don't own a Bible that you can read and understand, we would love for this Bible to be our gift to you. We want to encourage you to take it with you at the end of the day if you need it. So just raise your hand. They'll bring you a Bible to use or keep it according to your need. 1 Corinthians chapter chapter 12, verse 27. Paul writes, all of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. First are apostles, second are prophets, third are teachers, then those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing, those who can help others, those who have the gift of leadership, those who speak in unknown languages. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret those languages? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now, let me show you a way of life that is best of all. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word of truth. And we pray now that as we gather around it, that you would sow it deeply into our lives and that it would take root there and spring up and bear fruit. That it would change the way that we feel and it would change the way that we think, that it might change the way that we live, that we might be your people in the world, not because we say we are, but because it's evident by the way that we live our lives and live our lives together. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. You remember how as a kid you used to dress up in a in what you wanted to be one day. Maybe it was a policeman or a fireman or a princess or maybe even a superhero. The first attempt that I remember of trying to wear a costume every day was underoos. Some of you are old enough to know what those are. They were billed as underwear that was fun to wear. Um, they, mine were Aquaman. Thankfully, there are no pictures of me in Aquaman underoos. I'm not even sure he's a superhero anymore. I found out something very disturbing the other day about underoos. They come in adult sizes now. <laughs> I wasn't really sure how I felt about that, and now I really know how I feel about it. Sad. That's how I feel about it. And if you happen to have on underoos this morning, I'm not judging you, but I'm kind of judging you. So, yeah, uh, it, it's it's uh, connected to that that desire to be something else when we grow up, to be something of significance when we grow up, is connected to our search for significance even as adults. I mean, we, we grow up and we don't wear underoos anymore, we don't wear costumes anymore if we don't want to be committed, but we, we do still long to be people that have a purpose and some way of contributing to something that is larger than our, than our own lives and our own selves. In fact, Miss, mo, many of the conversations that I have with people who are stuck or who are looking for purpose or who are just feel like they're just going through the motions is that they can't connect what they do with something that is greater than just getting up and picking up a screw and put it in the hole and pick up a screw and put it in the hole and pick up a screw and put it in the hole and, the hole and clock out and go home. There's nothing wrong with picking up a screw and putting it in the hole and clocking out and going home. All sorts of jobs by all sorts of people can have meaning, 
but not if we look for the meaning in just the work. It's, it's to the people in Corinth that Paul writes who are in a similar kind of circumstance. He's writing to merchants and seamstresses and, and people who worked and lived in the community of Corinth, a bustling metropolitan city, had lots of people who were going to work every day. But Paul writes to the Christians in that place and said, your purpose your sense of um, meaning and contribution can't just be about getting up and going to work. It's, it's something larger and more significant than that, that you are cooperating with God in the world in what he's doing. And remember, this is new for Christians. They don't, we don't really have much of the New Testament. We don't really have, haven't had this long extended conversation about the purposes of God. Paul's writing to those who are in their everyday lives and Paul is saying there's a role that, is, that you are playing, there's a role you need to get connected to that is much more significant than just what you're showing up to do in work. And so he makes this long list. Uh, we read part of it, but this is not Paul's only list. In Corinthians, he lists uh, quite a few uh, gifts there, but he has another list in the book of Romans. He adds a few, and he has another list in the book of Ephesians, none in conflict with each other, but he just kind of builds on it. Part of that is the conversation with the Corinthians about how God has put them together. So if, before we get to our passage, we begin to read, Paul says, hey, everybody's got a gift. You're all kind of different. You're, there's some diversity. He says there's a, there's a unity, though, in Christ. We have faith in Christ. We all have the Holy Spirit. Then there's this diversity of gifts. Then he comes back to the theme of unity, he says, and, and because of that, we all need each other. And there's this interdependence. And then he begins to articulate the specifics, and that's where we come to our lists. In, in our first verse, he closes one conversation and opens another conversation. And this conversation we're looking at today is about how they are to live lives of contribution, lives of significance. He, he kind of draws a baseline in verse 27 where he says, all of you are part of the body of Christ. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. This reminded, circling back to them, maybe really circling back for us too, this reminder that we are all gifted by God. We may not know what our gift is, but when we come to faith, when we say yes in Jesus, the Holy, to Jesus, the Holy Spirit moves into our lives in its fullness and begins to produce fruit. That fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are in Galatians chapter 5. That is the Spirit producing fruit in our life so that we are growing up to be like Jesus. But the Holy Spirit doesn't just produce fruit, it gives gifts. And those gifts are for us to be on mission with Jesus in the world, no matter what we show up daily to do as work or as vocation. Everybody's been given a gift. You may not know what it is may not be a follower of Jesus yet, so you're kind of curious what those gifts are. They are gifts of the Spirit, so they are gifts given to people who have already said yes to Jesus. But the Spirit longs to give us a gift. If we're, on, if we're inside the body of Christ, we have one. If we're outside the body of Christ trying to figure out, the Spirit wants to pour into your life a way to cooperate with Jesus in the world so that there's meaning and purpose and not just routine. Now, to, to that end, the orchard has always believed that we are engaged in the work of growing deep in the love of Jesus so that we can branch out to the world, branch out to others with that love. This conviction that we have, that as we grow up to be like Jesus and the gifts that he's given us kind of multiply and grow, then we have this incredible opportunity to invite others to the love of Christ. So this has not just been our conviction. This is the testimony of what we're reading here in Scripture that we are all given a gift. Now, now why? Why would God bother giving us gifts? Because let's just be honest. There's got to be much more efficient ways of accomplishing his mission in the world than depending on me. Me who has an underdeveloped gift. Me who may not be even aware that I have a gift. Me who may be unwilling to use the gift because I'm anxious or fearful or not confident in it. God, why would you give us a gift? Because there's got to be a better way to get your work done than relying on us. Um, you may have heard me say at some point, if you've been here before, that I am 
not handy at all. Uh, my wife ordered a ceiling fan this week, and she was unpacking it yesterday, and I said, call my brother, who's a master electrician, because I am not have no shot of hanging that thing. But we kind of work like that. He hangs my ceiling fans. I give him a free baptism. We kind of swap off, you know, <laughs> good for good. So he, um, he, he has those kinds of skills and gifts, but I, I can do something some simple things that aren't really handy, I would call them painting, I don't call handy. I can, I can slap some paint on a wall. When my kids were little, they always wanted to help, which is a problem for me because I'm OCD. But I would give them a little bit of paint in a cup and a brush and I would put them behind the door. They could paint behind the door because you could cover it up. And I'd look back at those moments and say, they, they enjoyed that. It, it was a stretch for me. It could have been done more efficiently. It could have been done better, but there was joy because they were participating with me. I think God must look at us and say, you know what, that could be done more efficiently. That could be done more effectively. I could accomplish it without them, but there's such joy in participating with God in what he's up to in the world, which is why he invites us into that. It's why he gives us gifts. So we can find the joy of doing something with God in the world because it's in that relationship foundationally at the beginning that purpose and life and joy is found. It's with that in mind that Paul doesn't just write, you're gifted, he says that you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. It's verse 31, if you have your Bible still open, earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. We know what earnest desire is, right? It's a zealous pursuit. And we know what it means to zealously pursue some things. Maybe it's a sale, or maybe it's a position, or maybe it's an acquisition of something. We want a boat, or a house, or a car, or season tickets, or a purse, or whatever it is we zealously pursue. A lot of things in our world, but Paul says, if we could just take that zealous pursuit, that thing we know how to do, and we could just turn it toward zealously pursuing, growing up, acquiring, finding using the gifts that God has given us, the, the, the reward for us, the back to us, is that we, we discover what we were created for. We are to earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. We are to zealously pursue, but what are the most helpful gifts? I mean, we, we look at the list, if we were to look at the, the list again, and I were to ask you, just take a minute. What would you say would be the most helpful list, helpful gift on that list. If you had to pick it out, what would you say? Well, maybe you'd say it's the gift of prophecy, which is interpretation of scripture for somebody's kind of building up, not just vocationally what I do, but like when you sit across the table from somebody else and the spirit gives you some insight and you're able to speak truth into somebody's life or a group of people, like a small group. That's the gift of prophecy. Maybe that's the most important gift. Maybe that's the most helpful gift, and we should earnestly desire that. Well, that's great, unless what you need is not an interpretation of Scripture, but a comforting arm in a moment of need. Maybe, maybe the most, most helpful gift is the gift of knowledge. People have this deep insight into Scripture. Wes Schrickel is one of our pastors. He's a discipleship pastor here. I tell people he's one of the smartest people I know, period. But sometimes I have to say, Wes, dial it back a little bit, bring it down to my level, because he is so knowledgeable. It's incredibly helpful unless what I really need is a a, a friend in prayer. Maybe, Maybe the most helpful gift is um, helps. And that just kind of makes everything else happen. I do the little, help people with the gift of helps do all the little things that nobody really sees. A lot of administration, a little organization, filling in the gaps, picking up, dropping off so that what is very public and out front gets to happen. Maybe that's the, the most helpful gift. Maybe it's the gift of helps. Well, it probably is, unless what you need is wisdom and insight into a particular circumstance. So, so which gift on the list is the most helpful? If we're to earnestly desire it, we need to know what it is that we're supposed to earnestly desire. Paul doesn't tell us. I think the reason Paul doesn't tell us is that every gift on the list can be the most helpful gift in a particular circumstance. Whatever the need is, whatever, whatever the, the opportunity is, there's a, there's a special 
opportunity for somebody with that gift to be the most helpful gift. If you read the rest of Corinthians, Paul is talking to them about their um, fascination with the gift of tongues, of speaking unknown languages. He goes, don't worry about the gift of tongues. Don't worry about speaking unknown languages. That's not even important. And, and he's not saying that's not important. He's saying it's not important for you because it's not the most helpful thing. It's not the thing you need the most. The most helpful gift is the thing that we need the most in the circumstance so that we can know that every gift, the gift you've been given, and you've all been given a gift, the gift that I've been given can be the gift that we earnestly desire to use because the circumstance may require that gift more than any other. So that we don't, we don't begin to elevate one more than another. We recognize everybody's needed in order to accomplish the purposes of God in our life together and with our life together in the world. You may have heard this quote before. If the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. Well, Paul's actually advocating for looking at it a completely opposite way, and that is, instead of looking at the tool and saying, well, here's what I have, what am I supposed to do with it? We look at all of the opportunities and go, what kind of tools do we need? And then we're able to look in the body of Christ and say, we got them all. We can, we can step into every opportunity in our lives together, into every opportunity in the community in which we live, in the region in which we live, in the state in which we live, in the world in which we live, because God in his goodness has given everybody a gift that when used together accomplishes the purposes of God. We, some, we sometimes feel like we don't have a gift or we feel like our gift is not as important. But Paul is writing to contradict this in the Corinthians and in our lives. I don't know if you pay attention when we do uh, baptism videos right before we baptize somebody. But if you listen to uh, one of our children who come to be baptized, it's true of adults too. But often a child will in their video say, well, um, my, they'll name somebody, Mr. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so was really helpful in helping me understand what it means to come to faith. And then I pray with my mom, or I pray with my dad, or maybe even I prayed with them. And they're identifying often somebody who serves in our Sprout Patch or Grow Zone ministry. Our Sprout Patch ministry is birth up to five years old, and then our Grow Zone ministry is kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, and so they, they're identifying somebody who's been important to them in making that decision. And that person gets named. But what's not seen behind that is, you know, the person, let's say it's their small group leader. The reason that small group leader is to have that personal conversation with that child is because earlier in the week, a volunteer showed up to cut out and to put together the materials that that leader, that small group leader would need to teach in that class. And a different volunteer purchased, went and purchased those resources and somebody else, another volunteer, organized them into a box and then placed them in the rooms. And then a different volunteer uh, stood in the foyer and helped a parent check that child in when they came into the foyer. And if they were a first-time child or didn't know where they were going, another volunteer walked them to Sprout Patrick to Grow Zone Ministry. And then a different volunteer was standing at the top of the stairs welcoming them. And another volunteer, somebody else was serving to to help them get to their room. Some other volunteer was leading worship in that space. Another volunteer was teaching the total group in that space. And, and all, of those, all of those gifts are used to get to that one decision. They're not all the same gift, but all incredibly necessary for the thing that God wants to do in a person's life, in a child's life, in an adult's life. So the question becomes not what kind of gift do I have, but where is my gift needed? And the answer to that is all over the body of Christ, all over this community of faith called the Orchard, all over this community that we call Tupelo in the greater area. God has given us a gift. We are, earnestly to, we are to earnestly desire to use that gift, to discover and to grow and to apply that gift in the most helpful way. And the most helpful way Paul uh, shows us 
is he opens chapter 13. This is one of my favorite transitions in all of the New Testament. Paul spends all of chapter 12 talking about all these gifts that everybody's got. And then he says, but let me tell you something. More important than any gift you have is the context in which you use it. And here's the context. Love. You, you can have all the gifts you want, but if you don't use them in love, it doesn't matter. I'm just a, a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I can, even, I can be even so devoted to using my gift that I give everything I have to the poor and my body to be burned. But if I don't love, it doesn't matter. This 13th chapter gets read a lot at weddings. I dare say if you have been to more than one wedding, you have probably heard the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians read. It's a beautiful description of love, but the description that Paul uses here of love is not about a husband and a wife. It's, it's about the relationship that's supposed to happen in the community of faith so that we understand that we are to earnestly desire the most helpful gifts, the gifts that we've been given, and we're to use them sacrificially so that when we use them, however we use them, the experience of the person who is receiving the, the outcome of our gift is the love of Jesus. When we use our gift, when we use the gift that God has given us, the other person's experience is of the love of Christ. Now, I think Paul clarifies this for the Corinthians, not just for the whole purpose conversation, but because they, like we, sometimes use our gifts out of reluctance. We have a gift for teaching, or we have a gift for insight, or we have a gift for prayer, or we have a gift for taking care of people, but we don't want to make that kind of commitment. And so we just do the easy thing. The thing, you know, we just show up and we, and we serve for 20 minutes, or we serve for 30 minutes, or we drop something off, or all very important ways to serve. But often, we choose to use our gifts reluctantly rather than fully. The other extreme, instead of using them reluctantly, is that we, we use what I call kind of, kind of kamikaze commitment. That means that I'm all in. Something needs to be done, you tell me. I'm there, I'll do it. I may not be gifted for it. I may run roughshod on everybody that I'm there with, but I'm going to be there and I'm going to serve. And I can't tell you how important that willingness is to a community of faith. We appreciate that deeply. But if you serve there over a long period of time like that, in that with that attitude, in that way, no, no sense of what your giftedness is, no, no purpose to to have people experience the love of Jesus by the way you use your gift, then most often they don't experience the love of Jesus. They experience a task getting done, and, and they miss the love of Jesus, which is the purpose of the giftings. Paul and, and God's intent is quite different than either reluctance or kamikaze. It's is to earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. That means that we use our gifts when we and how we are the most helpful sacrificially so that somebody else experiences the love of Jesus when we use that gift. Frederick Beekner, I, I love the way he summarizes this. He says, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Isn't that awesome? Where, where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. I don't know about you, but I look out, I see hungers everywhere. Everywhere. When we use the gifts that God has given us to meet those deep hungers because of the love of Jesus being expressed through us, there's deep gladness for us. There's joy, there's purpose, there's meaning. We find joy and others find Jesus. What more could we ask for? And to that end, you finding that place, we want to help you today. When you came in, you received a card. It looks like this. It's an opportunity for you to say, I'm interested in having a conversation about how to use my gifts. It's not a commitment card. 
It's not we're going to call you and enroll you next week and you will have um, a commitment for the next 10 years of your life. This is an invitation to a conversation. It's you saying, I know what my gift is. I'd be interested in using it here. Or even say, I don't know what my gift is, but I'd love to have a conversation about using it because I have this passion, this desire for some area of ministry. Now, if you're already serving somewhere, you don't have to fill one of these out. You can, if you want to serve in an additional place, but mainly this is for folks who are still trying to find the place where they can use their gifts, being most helpful so that somebody will experience the love of Jesus. If that's you, fill this out, drop that in the black boxes by the door as you leave this morning and somebody will reach out to you. Well, some of you are thinking, I, I've, I've done that. I did that at another, another church before I came here. I've done that at this church for a long time. We, we, don't, we, don't, get, um, we don't get to shrug off God's design for our lives. Well, let me take that. We can shrug off God's design for our lives. We go back to this deep longing, this deep ache for something larger and more significant than just getting up and going to work. For this reason, God has gifted us and given us one another and together given us to the world that they might know, that we might know the love of Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that despite all of the inefficiencies, despite all of the going in behind us and having to clean up our messes that you do, you invite us to be a part of what you're up to in the world. It's there that we find joy. It's, it's for this purpose that you created us. And so, Lord, I pray that in this, in this quiet of these moments, you might lead us, strengthen us, call us, confront us, convict us. Show, it, show us how it is that you long to use us to embrace the world, to embrace our workplace, to embrace our school with the love of Jesus. We pray all of this in the powerful name of Christ. Amen.